as you enter the, enter the webinar, just let us know where you're from, how the sound is. This is not Dr. Riley. This is nope. Dr. Raquel Butler, just in case you're wondering, but don't worry, he's on his way. <laughs> I mean, last night I have to keep telling people, Bob's not here, Bob's not here, Bob's not coming. Um, Bob still doesn't have power for anybody who joined us last night. As you enter, please let us know where he's from and if the sound. All right, I gotta send that to everybody, not just the panelists. There we go. Um, yeah, so so Dr. Riley, he's a veterinarian, of course, and of course he's uh, was out working today and thought he'd be home by three o'clock, and and he called me at five thirty, said he was almost home. <laughs> so um, uh, Dr. Bellini knows him quite well, so we thought we'd just bring uh, Rachel in and have her kind of tell us some stories about Dr. Riley until he shows up and he can watch the webinar later and find out what we said about him. Um, All right, this will be his It was raining in Worcester. It's, um, yeah, so um, for anybody that um, wanted to watch Bob Bowker yesterday, um, the storm, Cristobal basically took out his power, big hail, the size of ice cubes. Um, he still doesn't have power. I'm hoping to reschedule him for this weekend, but if he doesn't have power, we can't reschedule. So um, we're just waiting to hear from Bob about when he's going to have enough power uh, to get back on the internet so that we can um, get that webinar. Because I have the slides. I have all the, the PowerPoint. But, um, so Rachel and I met, no, Rachel and I met in Colorado. Uh, yep. Was it only a year ago? A year ago. A year ago. It feels like, you know, sister from another mother. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're getting a little punchy here. Mercury's about to go into retrograde and technology is starting to fail. So um, anyway, um, so we met last summer in Colorado and then um, I went to AAP. I had a booth there and Rachel was going to AAP. And so she just kept dragging all of her vet friends over to my booth. Um, and having them stand and kneel on surefoot pads. And one of the veterinarians she brought over is Dr. Mark Riley, who's from um, South Shore Equine in Massachusetts. Um, I'll let Mark tell you about his practice, but um, Rachel, just tell us a little bit about, you know, how you met Mark and, and um, why you drug him over to my booth. <laughs> Well, so Mark and I are both uh, graduates of Tufts University Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine. We both graduated in the class of 1991, and um, there were not a lot of equine kids in the class, so those of us that were interested in horses sort of hung out together. And uh, we also had another good friend, Dr. Tim Ober, who is in a class ahead of us, who is also a very prominent equine veterinarian and so the three of us um would would hang out and uh to try to try to get the clinicians to let us work on the horses and and, and do stuff of course mark and tim succeeded much more than i did but um our, our our class our class was um you know just this amazing class it's sort of renowned in, in tough history of being just a very 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 high means very very smart kids um it was really we had a bunch fail out the first year because they graded us all on the means and the means were just ridiculously high and um i actually would have probably flunked out except for the anatomy of teacher changed my grade so um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> i can say that now i have a diploma but i one day got a little note in my box saying rachel i've changed your grade from a d to a c so that anatomy. Me, anatomy, yeah. Because our anatomy lab was in the basement, but when we went to Tufts, it wasn't all out of grass, and the first two years were in the city in Boston. And so um, we had to drive into the city, and the anatomy lab was in this basement. And it was like everybody was getting bloody noses from the formaldehyde, it was getting sick, and it was just, uh, you couldn't you couldn't hardly be in there. And I, I, I really wanted to go riding, so anatomy lab, I would up and leave. But Dr. Kumar and I were good friends, and I was actually going to work with him the following summer as an assistant. And so I, he knew he knew that I was going to be, I think he knew I was going to be fine, and he knew that the repercussions. So anyway, I did make it out of, along with the class of 1991, along with the brilliant and much more intelligent Dr. Mark Riley, who had gone on to do um, just so many amazing things. Um, he, 
he's had his own clinic for years and he's gone to business school and um, he's just a great vet and he's a great person. And so I actually, Wendy, when we were at the AAP, it was got crazy. I started bringing people down and people started coming and the booth started getting really, really busy and the orders were flying out and there was nothing left in the warehouse. And it was very exciting and a lot of fun because people really were super excited about the pads and they really liked them. And so she was like, I need some help with this business. I'm like, oh, I know just the person for you. And so I dragged Mark over and Mark was kind of like, hmm, sort of serious. You know? <laughs> but I knew, knew that he would, he would enjoy, he would enjoy all this. I, I felt it would be a good match in terms of working together because, uh, you know, when he's very creative and Mark's sort of curious, and so I thought it would be kind of You were absolutely right. You so, know, so and, um, uh, just to let, I'll let people know a little bit. So Mark is, um, has an MBA and what he does is business coaching. And so um, we talked very briefly at AAP about him being my business coach. And then in the process, of course, I arranged to go to his clinic in January and do a, a Surefoot demo for all of his veterinarians at his practice. So I figured, you know, if nothing else, at least I'll have another vet that understands Surefoot because I'll just go up there and I'll do my little PowerPoint, which I did. And then I did my, you know, live demo. And we brought Mark's horse in. And I actually have pictures of Mark's horse. Um, let me see if I can pull those up. Um, uh, and um, his horse is a, is a standard bred racehorse. Um, this is him from the back at least. Um, and so I went to the clinic, it's a lovely, clinic, beautifully designed actually, it was really quite impressive. And he wasn't sure if his horse was gonna stand on pads. And as you can see, um, <laughs> he stood on four pads uh, pretty easily. You know, and he was kind of a fool around a bit horse. I'll just show you another picture. Can you see this one from the front? Did that show up? I'll just, no, I didn't see I'll one. stop screen share and re-screen share because screen share gets a little bit weird. Um, but I mean, he's a big guy, right? Uh, okay. so, um, yeah, wow. Yeah, he's a big guy. He's a, he's a standard bread trotter. And um, I'm trying to remember why he was in the barn, but he's in the barn in the back. And I just love his blue and red blanket. I think it goes really well with the Sherwood pads. <laughs> you know, all those bright colors. Um, and so, you know, I did this demo and he was, then we would talk about the, the business and, um, and business coaching. And he was like, you know, I, I liked your PowerPoint presentation. Um, I, I don't know that he was as, as impressed by the actual demo, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. Um, and we talked for a little bit and decided that this, this might be a good fit because, you know, I, I mean, I started this business. Oh, here, I'll show you what his clinic looks like in the winter. Um, I started this business in uh, 2012, and I've only ever taught riding lessons and never made a product in my life. So, um, so no way. This is actually on Martha. Never mind, wrong place. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, you know, we, we decided to go further, and um, I we came to an agreement, and then um, uh, what what was really fun was that you could see Mark was really skeptical about what I was doing to start with. And it was like, okay, I'm gonna, you know, you know, be your business coach, my thought, I'm gonna be your business coach, but I'm really not sure about what she's up to. You know, it's kind of crazy. And, um, and every time I talked to him, there was a little more interest and a little more curiosity. And of course he, I left pads with him. And, um, and now when I call him, he's like super enthusiastic about Surefoot, he's, he's been using it in his practice. And so it's really fun to take a skeptic New Englander, because I'm from New England, and, um, and a guy, and, uh, and watch him come around to this crazy idea of sticking brightly colored pads under the horse's feet. Because um, when you think about it, I mean, if somebody just walked up to you and said, I'm going to stick this pad underneath the horse's feet, and he's going to change, I mean, people used to look at me like I had three heads, because like, they're like, really you're gonna what what are you doing that was nobody could figure out what i was doing at first but now which is really fantastic there's enough people and um the thing about going to aap that was so amazing and that rachel was going to all the lectures right um was to find out that veterinarians were actually talking about surefoot in their lectures to other veterinarians um and i had no idea this was going on behind 
vaccines in the veterinary world. So Rachel, just tell them a little bit about some of the lectures that you went to and what they were saying about Surefoot in those lectures. Uh, so Melissa King, who um, runs the big rehab center here in Colorado, Colorado State, um, and she gave a lecture and um, CSU was really funny because they're really hardcore about branding. So they wouldn't actually call them Surefoot pads, but they would call them balance pads and they would call it balance training. And um, so that was always kind of sort of amusing, but I knew they were sharp up pads because I could see them in the videos and I got super excited. I also have a friend who is doing a residency up there and she told me, so that was great. So they talked a lot about just their rehab program. And I mean, they have all of their rehab horses standing on pads pretty much every day. And, yeah. you know, that was great. And then same with Steve Adair, you know, um, and he, he's another rehab, big rehab veterinarian in Tennessee, right? East Tennessee. And yeah, I actually, um, um, I was going to Tennessee to do some teaching and um, a friend of mine, Catherine Wyckoff, who did the Feldenkrais webinar with me, she was in his program. And so okay. he actually went for the in-person in, uh, in part of the, um, the rehab training that they do at UT Tennessee. And the story goes that they had this horse that every time you picked up its front foot and put it down, it would cross the other front leg. And it was happened every single time. And all the vets there, Dr. Dare, and, and I don't know who the, um, the spine specialist is from CSU. Um, uh, oh, um, uh, Hoffler. Kevin yes, Hoffler? he had looked yep. at this horse and the physical therapist, everybody had looked at this horse. And Dr. Dare mentioned that he had heard about this thing called Surefoot. And Catherine, who was the third horse I ever put on pads, was Catherine's horse, Andy. She just raised her hand and said, well, I happen to have my pads in the car. Would you like a demonstration? And so um, they said yes. So before the demo started, she was talking to the physical therapist who hadn't been in on the conversation, as I understand it, who was terribly skeptical, like, you know, whatever. And, um, and so then what they did was uh, Catherine went to the horse and picked up the front foot and it crossed the other front leg. And Mark's just shown up on the screen, but I'll finish the story. I so no idea. And, um, and she did 10 minutes of sure foot, just 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, she picked up the foot and it went straight down. And that was in <laughs> front of Dr. Adair and the other doctor and the physical therapist. And so I stopped at UT Tennessee on my way to teach a clinic and spent three hours with Dr. Adair and talked about Surefoot nice. and talked about what we could do for a study. And that was like, I don't know, five years ago or something. And then I never heard from them again. <laughs> oh, wow. Right? And I mean, because, you know, I was busy doing what I was doing. And, um, and so, but then when we went to AAP, there he was. And, um, yeah, yeah. and he was talking about it when he was using them. So, well, no, I, you know, it's been really fun because a lot of my friends that I've had within a year, I've been pushing on them on everybody for a solid year. And now all of a sudden everyone's like, oh, which pad should I use? Oh, which, you know, oh, oh, which one should I buy? I mean, I have like five veterinarians now that have, you know, that have bought sets of pads. And, and, and today I got an email from a client like a year ago with a vet who I like brought the pads. The horse had a deep flex of 10. I had them out. I was like, the pads, and she got, I got an email. Oh, which pads did he like a year later? So, and everyone's everyone's coming around. They're all coming around. It's awesome. All right, yeah. I'm gonna leave you. Thank you so. I didn't much. tell too many embarrassing stories, Mark. I promise. <laughs> I didn't realize so you two went to school together. All right, Mark, I'm gonna make you co-host so that we get uh, more access here. There we go. We're just, all right, you can take me out, so I can. I'm gonna see if I can take you out, but I don't know if I can take. I don't want to take you out without losing you a uh, change role to attendee yep you're gone bye bye <laughs> hi rachel <laughs> <laughs> all right mark so um i've kind of well let me just do a little intro on the webinar which i usually do but we got busy um and then we'll bring you in so hi i'm wendy murdoch and i'm doing a series of webinars during the pandemic this is number 61. um when i started this i had no idea that i would be doing 60 plus webinars and that they would be so incredibly popular I get emails every single day, emails, text messages, and comments on the YouTube channel about the information that's coming forward through these webinars. It's such a pleasure and it's so fantastic to meet all the incredible people and to be able to connect their information with the public at large because we were just saying with Rachel, it's kind of like we all know we're out there, but our lives are so busy we don't connect. 
And so with Zoom meetings, it's given us an opportunity to connect, to share, and to bring you into the conversation, which I think is one of the most important things about doing these webinars. Today, my guest is Dr. Mark Riley from South Shore Equine, and I'm going to allow him to introduce himself, although Rachel's given us a little bit of your background, Mark. Oh, great. Um, and, and we'll talk about uh, your practice in Surefoot, so welcome. Well, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be be here. And as Rachel said on her parting, there's this wave that's happening. And I, I like to think that I'm a year behind Rachel. Um, you know, I, she talked to me about it a year or so ago. Then I saw her at AEP. You know, she talked to me some more about it. I went over and I met you. We started talking some more. And I said, okay, we'll give this a try. You came up to our clinic. Um, and, you know, our practice is it's half hospital, half ambulatory. A lot of sport horses. We do race horses, hunter jumpers, dressage, barrel horses. Anything that's out there in the New England area, um, we do a lot of diagnostics, a lot of performance evaluations. But we also have our fair share of hobby horses, you know, seasonal horses, older horses, pets, companions, whatever you want to call them. And I haven't found a limitation yet for the shorefoot. Um, with any of these, but I, at the same time, I consider myself a neophyte. I'm trying to figure out, you know, what's the most efficient way to get them feeling better sooner or whatever. Um, and I'm constantly learning, um, which has been good. And I have some pictures that show some of the things that we've done. Unfortunately, I, I haven't done as good a job taking pictures as I should, but we've got a couple of things that I can show you. But you know, we, we try everything here. We have a complimentary veterinarian does a lot of acupuncture and chiropractic. Um, you know, we do a lot of, you know, blocks and imaging and things like that. And everything we try to do is evidence-based. So if we can find something somewhere that somebody's already done with good success, then we're going to relay that to our client, to our patients. So the sure foot to me is just one of these things that I would consider myself not an early adopter of almost anything, but I am an avid reader, an avid observer, and I do think that I have um, a bunch of feelers out there with a lot of colleagues, whether they're from school or from previous associations. I've worked up and down the East Coast doing all kinds of things, and I have no problems picking up the phone and talking to somebody and meeting up with them wherever I can and, you know, give me some more information. How are you doing it? What are you doing? And I think that's where I am with Surefoot right now is when I can, I talk to Rachel, I talk to those people like that, that how are you doing it? What are you doing? And I, I, I've learned sometimes with trial and error, made some mistakes, you know, um, had some horses refused to get on the pads until I backed up and realized, okay, I think I approached this horse wrong. Um, and that's happened a few times. And I've also watched my clients make the exact same mistakes. Maybe with, a, you know, I made it with a different horse, which has been nice because I've been able to troubleshoot why their horse won't get on for them, but get on for me. Um, and that's helped. Um, I've yet to have a horse that hates them. You, you know, I mean, there are sometimes you you just want to put a weight tape around a horse and it's just not happening. You know, you can let them sniff it. You can rub them with it. As soon as you put that around him, he freaks out. And with the short foot so far, I think once you gradually get them on it, you can see them just kind of relax into it. And um, I don't know, sometimes it's kind of comical. For some of the horses you're thinking, no way, no how, they like it. You know, they almost kind of nudge at you. Like, hey, you know, I'm okay. I'll stand right here. But at the same time, what I hear from a lot of clients initially is, how do I know when to take them off? I'm like, ask your horse. And it seems like they stand there until they're done. And then they step off them. And I, I don't put them back on if they've been on for five or 10 minutes. I'm like, okay, he's done. Let's just move on with whatever it is we're moving on with. But I can also tell you clinically, we've been finding some uses of them diagnostically, um, which I think we backed into by, by pure chance, which I think a lot of medicine happens that way. Um, but we've learned some things and I have one or two pictures of that. And I, sometimes I, I just watching the horse respond and I can't say that I've done enough that I can say well I've done so many of these I know what this means but I do see some common things that happen so common things happen commonly um, you know one of the things would be a lot of my standard and race horses a lot of my dressage horses really like to stand on the slants on their hind feet and you know I think this is some of that you know lower lumbar SI hip 
um, tightness that once we get onto it, they seem to just relax and they seem to move a little better. And then it's a matter of convincing the client that this should become part of your routine. And it's kind of comical because there are times that I will bring slants with me and I'll leave them. And I'll say, just try these every day for the next week or so, you know, see how it goes, you know, give me some feedback. And then I come back the next week or 10 days. <clears throat> I said, how's it going? Good. I said, all right, why do you take those slants back? What? what why, why are you taking them back? And it's, well, you know, I have another client that I want to try them on. And I said, look, if you'd like to purchase them, I'll tell you how to purchase them. I said, but these are kind of my ones that bounce around in my truck. You know, you can get yourself a brand new pair if you want. And there are times that, hmm, I don't know where they are. And we have to go find them in a, you know, hidden away in a corner somewhere. Um, so that's been kind of comical that um, I think the people who use them really like them. And then it's a matter of me trying to transition them into get, get your own. You know, those are mine. I need them back. Um, so, um, you know, the pads, for those of you who don't know, come in all different, I guess, uh, when do was the word? Firmness? It was it's hard, yep. it's firm, it's softness, density. right? Density. Um, and I, I'm still learning what that all means because um, sometimes I, you know, show one picture of a horse that I thought no way would he stand on a, a soft pad and he loved it. And I was like, hmm, I wonder what this means because I was really surprised by it, but we tried it and he loved it. And I'm still not quite sure what it all means to me because you'll see it's his right front and his left hind. Uh, yeah, trying to figure this horse out. Um, the physio pad, the thin big pad, um, I kind of use as an introduction to a lot of horses, especially the laminitic horses. Um, sometimes they're just so nervous, so painful, and I have to put them on a block to get some x-rays. So I've always used the wooden blocks, and then we've now transitioned to the short foot blocks, which they seem to accept much better. And I have a radiograph of that. But it seems to me sometimes if I can get them to stand on the physio pad, it's almost like I've gotten some trust from the horse that, okay, you know, this guy isn't trying to inflict more pain onto me. You know, he might actually be trying to relieve some pain. In the past, I used to use the kneelers, you know, that you'd use in your garden or something like that. Um, but they go through those very quickly. Um, they tear them um, and they're not very thick. So, you know, I do think the physio pads help quite a bit. We've tried it on a few horses who come in that are uncomfortable, whether they're colicking or tying up or something like that. And if you can get them Sometimes we sedate these horses and try to slip the physio pad on them. And I do think they relax a little bit longer. Now, the clinicians here, there's six of us here, we'll argue sometimes over, no, 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 you just sedated them. And that was in like, you know, that sedation lasts pretty long in that horse. And, you know, so I think there's something there that if they can get some relief somehow, um, maybe it's that the floor was hard and their feet hurt. And that wasn't why they were here, but that was part of their problem. So that's what I mean. I'm still learning what it all means. And... Um, so I, <laughs> right. Um, I've been doing this for eight years and I'm still learning what it means. And, you know, I have a picture of my staff standing on the pads, you know, everyone's trying to figure out what pad they like. And, you know, I've done the same thing, you know, it's trying to figure out, you know, what is it that this horse likes about this, you know, trying to figure it out. Um, and I do find myself standing on some of the pads and I start swaying and, it, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, this is weird. But, you know, it's kind of subconscious. You don't know you're swaying until somebody says something to you and you realize, hey, I'm actually moving left and right here. And, and I'm thinking, is it my lower back? Is it my hips that are getting this? Or maybe it's my knees. I've had a history of some knee issues. I'm like, hey, my knees are starting to like this. Huh? So, you know, I don't think, I, I guess in my opinion, from what I know so far, nothing means one thing that I think three different horses could behave the same way for three different problems. And that's what I'm you know, not, not so much struggling. But that's what I'm learning about now is, you know, how can I help this horse? What can I do? And, and going from there. Um, but I think diagnostically it's really helped me when I try to tell somebody something and I say, look, let's just try this and see if this horse relaxes a little bit. And when they do, it's like, okay, you know, we need to address this. And, at some point here, I'll show you some officially particular horse that I x-rayed and what we learned from using the short foot pads and x-raying them, um, which I thought was pretty interesting. So lots to learn. Yeah. And, and um, you, you know, I, I agree with you that 
you can take five to diff 10 different horses and they're all going to respond in a similar way because horses only have so many ways they can respond. But why they're responding to it can be very different, whether it's relief of pain or soreness or comfort or um, grounding. And, and I don't think there's any way we can really honestly know what any horse is experiencing because we can't even know what a person is experiencing other than ourselves when we're standing on them. Um, but if you were to guess how they work, if you were to just kind of postulate what systems do you think they're affecting? Okay, well, I think there's some proprioception that occurs. Um, and some of that depends on which pad they're on. I think um, you're getting feedback. Um, you know, the, the body's receiving feedback from a new postural position, which then engages other parts of the body, which um, sometimes it might even engage the leg that we, that we think we're we're working on right now, but other times it engages the core, it engages the back, or it engages something else. Um, but I think, I, I really think the biggest thing is I, I think it's a proprioceptive feedback that we have just removed the earth from this horse and put something else there. And the horse now has the capability of altering where it wants to put its pressure. And you know, I always think you, you can relate it to the, the laminated course. We always tell folks that if you look, if you can get some deep sand, put your horse in the deep sand, because what he'll do is he'll create the angles that he wants. Once we know the angles that he wants, we might have a better idea of how to shoe this horse, how to elevate this horse. And I think sometimes the pads do that is, is you know, you, you take the physio pads big enough for two feet. And after the horse comes off, you'll see why well, one, one foot was a lot heavier than the other foot. But when he's standing there on the, on the wash rack, you really can't appreciate that. You know, he's standing straight. Um, and the, the farriers will tell me sometimes, you know, I know this horse was bearing more weight because that foot flattens out and the left foot doesn't, you know, and over year, you know, years and years later, you might see some contracture on the foot. Um, so I, I think that's the biggest thing I've learned is I think the horse is getting his own feedback. And I, I'm sure that you've seen horses get relaxed standing on the pads. Yes. How do you think that's happening what's it, you know I, I think it's the same thing and I think what they're able to do is engage a different part of their body they're able to compensate maybe maybe it's tighten their core maybe it's that you know my hips have been so sore that I've been tightening my hips and you know what to do it then all of a sudden I can relax my hips a little bit and when I relax my hips I can actually stand up straight and use my shoulders um, so I, I think it's that compensation of if I can relieve the stress here then maybe I can stand straighter i can stand more comfortably i can actually put my foot where it belongs and i think just by doing that you know it'd be like you know i remember before i had my knee injected many years ago i didn't realize i was leaning on the barn doors all the time i was always leaning off my right leg and and it wasn't until i got my knee injected i realized wow i was in a lot of pain but it was one of these things that it didn't happen overnight it was wear and tear and wear and tear and wear and tear and then when he injected my knee i was like this is what horses feel like when they get their joints injected. Wow. So I think there's some, some of that is that they're able to, you know, a horse can't stand there with one foot up in the air, but I think with the pad, he can kind of alter the way he, he puts his, puts his weight. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what I found with some of these horses too, they seem like they relax and then they make another move. Like it's like they kind of grind into the pad and they're like, Oh, I like this. And then if you have four pads on them, all of a sudden he kind of shifts over and it's like, okay, I've relaxed that hip. Now I'm going to relax the other hip or, you know, the right front. I'm going to put more weight on my right front now that maybe he wasn't doing before because, you know, his right hind bothered him or, so, or something like that. Uh, so uh, I, I think, you know, unfortunately I don't get to see them day after day after day. Usually I see them once then I come back a week later or something like that, you know, unless they're in the clinic and usually those horses are really sore. Um, so I, It'd be nice somehow, but the, maybe I get the owner to send me videos every day, but I don't know when I would watch them. Um, exactly. and, you know, but I think there's, I think there's that compensation that happens and I think it, it changes as the horse feels better. Like I say, grinds into it. Well, and you bring up a good point about your knee in that a lot of times, um, pain happens over time. It does, it's not acute. It's kind of like a, you know, 
it adds, it accumulates, right? right? And so we get used to it because it's been, it's with us every single day. And so our nervous system obviously says, you can't feel that intensity all the time. We're just going to kind of dull it out and you get used to it. But then when you actually feel that there can be a difference, that's when it's like, wow, okay, you know, this is really different because now I have a comparison. Exactly. Right. And I remember saying to the doctor when he injected my knee, I said, you know, what do I do if, if I don't get better, if the pain comes right back? And, you know, this is what all my clients ask me, you know, how, how long is this going to last, right? Mm-hmm. And, and he just looked at me and said, look, if you don't feel 100% in 30 days, you call me. Well, that was seven or eight years ago, right? And, but for two years, people, there's all these pictures of me leaning on my Twitch, leaning on stall doors. I used to drive on my left hip. You know, I was doing anything I could to unload my right my right hind, my right leg. Um, but like you said, it, it didn't. Ha- I didn't get in a car accident. It, I mean, yeah, I played a lot of sports when I was younger and some wear and tear. But bending down, picking up feet, getting knocked around, picking up, you know, heavy equipment, moving around. I mean, it wears on you. And there's no days off. I mean, you got to go, go, go. And I think when your body realizes you don't have to stand like that right now, and can it would, it would have to relax you. Mm -hmm. the nervous system is smarter than we are right it has to be right it has to get your finger off the stove before you feel it right so like you said it'll dull the pain it'll sharpen the pain it'll relax you it'll tighten you Um, and I think that's what we observe a lot of these horses when they get on there that you can kind of just see their facial expression relax sometimes they start to chew not all the time but sometimes you actually see that that oral release um, which is kind of nice to see um, and sometimes they just, you can see it's just their shoulders drop. You know, they just, uh, and, you know, I always, you know, talk to a lot of my high-end riders. I talk to them about the shoulder drop. And most of these people are, are like me, we're, you know, we're up all the time, whatever. And I'm like, just relax your shoulders. Like, what? I'm like, just relax your shoulders. I'm like, just drop your shoulders. Like, oh. And I'm like, this is what your horse feels like. You know, he's, he's just jazzed all the time. And now we're trying to get him just to drop, just relax. And, just stand. Yeah. So, cool. Yeah. All right. Um, how about sharing your screen and let's see some pictures. All right. So hopefully these work. I did one earlier today that a few folks had some trouble with, but let's try. The, it. the tricky part is if you move to a different screen or a different picture, sometimes screen share doesn't follow you. You have to unshare and reshare. That's kind of the trick. Let's see if we can do this. Okay, did it follow? Yeah, there we are. Okay, so this is the physio pad. Um, this is actually a 17 hand stand of bread. And this is just bringing it to him, seeing what he would do with it. And this is where he ended up, um, which I was very surprised at. This is when I talked about having the soft pads, uh, left hind, right front, which I, Never thought he would stand like this, but this is kind of an experiment. He had a little bit of an issue with his right front. He has chronic hip and, and hawk issues. Nothing bad. I mean, he gets injected once a year or something like that and gets a chiropractic adjustment to his hip. But when he stood like this, I'm like, well, that's really interesting. And, and he stood like this till he walked him off. I was like, okay, I got to get going. Um, and this is, my screen over. this is him with his slants. And I think this is when he was most comfortable. Um, he's on some soft ones up front. He's had chronic foot problems, quarter cracks, things like that. But then when he got on the slants behind, this is when he just dropped his head, felt a little better. Um, and I think my technician even said, wow, he's not trying to bite me anymore. Mm. Um, you know, he just was one of those horses, always busy, 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 and then he just stopped. This is my staff. <laughs> uh, some of my doctors, you know, and I think this might have been the day that you were there. Yeah. They're just everybody, and this happens every time I go somewhere. People like take their shoes off, they step on them. You know, some people leave their shoes on, but they want to, what's it feel like? What's it feel like? Oh, step on them. And people start, you know, if they stand on the lawn and they start swaying, they start moving back and forth. So I, I get a kick out of watching humans get on these. So this was um, a dressage horse who, um, he had some foot issues. And I was working with the farrier and not getting anywhere. And nobody, 
thought that his feet bothered him. I said, well, let's just see what happens. And this is one of those horses who, I don't have a, I have another picture you'll see in a minute, but this is a horse who dropped his shoulders. As soon as we got him on these pads, you could almost hear him exhale. He was like, oh. And this horse can be a little bit of a fruit when he wants to be. And this was one of those cases where you know, this was obviously right next to the, the wash stall. And I said, well, let's just see what he'll do. And he took to these things almost immediately and just kind of chilled out. And I said, well, let's put him on some pads behind. And we tried a bunch of different pads when I put the, the, um, firm, slants. the, the firm slants on him. Now he started to chill even more. And it, I was going to block this horse. Say, uh, I think his feet are bothering him. Let's block his horse. Let's block his feet and see what happens. But I said, you know, before we do that, let's just try this and see what happens. So we put him on these. He stood there probably eight or ten minutes, and then I said, okay, go ahead and ride him. Let's see what happens. And her second trip around the indoor arena, she said, what were those pads? And by the fourth trip, he looked as bad as he did before, but he definitely improved. I said, okay, this is going to become part of his ordeal. We ended up um, changing barriers too, and he's a completely new horse now. But this was one of those situations where I need my pads back, and it was a little bit of a struggle getting them back. This here is a picture using the sure foot block. So I don't know how many veterinarians may uh, be involved watching this right now. But this horse has uh, an Equilox pad that we put on because it was laminitic. And this is a right front foot. It's a good sized horse, 13, 1400 pound horse. And he's standing on um, the sure foot x-ray block. We tried him on the wooden box that I always used and he was just very, very difficult. Put him on the physio pad, he accepted the physio pad, moved him over onto the shore foot block. And we were able to get, you know, a very good x-ray. Uh, we were happy with it. But then um, we said, what happens if we put him on a x-ray block with a soft pad on top of it? And this is him when he gets a soft pad on top of the x-ray block. It's actually the physio pad, isn't it? Because I can see the line of the two layers. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. So to me, this is what I mean diagnostically that in the left picture, it looks like he's fully bearing weight. But when given the opportunity, he elevates his heel, which with laminitis, one thing we worry about is the stretch of the deep flexor tendon. Can you see my arrow there? Yep. So the deep flexor tendon is coming down here, comes underneath the bottom of his coffin bone. And here, he wants to unload his heel, which tells me there's some strain on that deep flexor tendon that we need to know about. So even though I had built him a pad that has a wedge to it, what we knew is, okay, when we trim and chew this horse, we've got to give him more wedge than I think he needed at that point. So I just got a, a pretty good kick out of this, that he was standing rock solid on his left, but on his right, he definitely unloaded his heel. Yeah, that might be the last slide that I put in there. Let's talk that for now. But I mean, that's to me that's some some of the learning curve that we're in right now. Of let's just check this out. Let's see what he does here. Let's see what he does there. And that horse ended up doing really well by getting two extra degrees of a wedge. Um, we did it on both front feet, and he walked significantly better almost immediately. So something to be learned. Um, much easier to do in a clinic situation where I can grab this pad and grab that block and do this and I have everything right here and I got all the minions that can run around for me. Um, but interesting at the very least. Yeah, and, and um, what you saw with using the physio pad for the x-ray is consistent with what Dr. Taylor seeing and, uh, and Ida Hammer um, from Whole Horse Trimming is seeing is that when they give the horse the opportunity to show them how they want to stand and when they've taken x-rays they get a much better sense of how then to treat that horse because they're actually seeing what the horse wants exactly right and this goes back to that thing i mentioned earlier but a lot of these laminated horses we stick them in the sand and we watch and see that they'll drill little ramps and sometimes the right front ramp is way up and the left front ramp is barely up and like okay that's how he wants to stand, and that's how we'll do it. Um, 
So this avoids getting truckloads of sand and watching it. Especially in the winter time. <laughs> right. So, you know, things that there's, there's, there's a lot of things to learn. And I, I think what I'm finding with a lot of horses who have to really use their hind ends is sometimes they're not lame. Um, sometimes the chiropractor or the acupuncturist will say, you know, I got this, I got that. And I think as veterinarians, sometimes it's not something that needs to be injected. It just needs whatever you want to call it, body work or whatever. And sometimes this is a, a way to back into it. So let's just try, try this, try that, and see if he relaxes a little. Um, because that horse, that dressage horse I showed, and even the standard bred, neither one of them were lame behind. Like, you know, their problems really have been up front. And you start wondering, is it because they're getting off behind, they're throwing at the, everything up front? And it's like, okay, so he doesn't have that pinpoint blockable lameness behind, but he has chronic soreness and things that we have to, to look after. You know, Dr. Bellini was on earlier. She might have been able to do some of her chiropractic and acupuncture stuff to unveil that stuff, but the majority of us practitioners out there, you know, I have a little bit in my armamentarium only because I have an associate um, who does those things, but you have to pick and choose what, what we're going to use for our diagnostics. Right, and we can't all be experts at everything. No. no. So, um, you know, it's interesting when you start talking about horses with soreness and that they like the slants. What, what do you think, I, you know, I've been told that you can only affect the joints up to the fetlock, but, you know, I see so many horses that when you put them on the slants behind, because people go, well, why, why are you using a slant? And to, I guess to me, it's a no brainer that I want to change those angles. Um, maybe because I've had so many hip problems and broke my left hip socket and et cetera, et cetera, that I have a sort of a pet project of hips. But um, do you, th how do you think that the, the angle is influencing the hindquarters? I, I guess my first answer was, I don't know. But um, I think it's just, it's given the horse the opportunity to adjust his body. Some of them don't take it, right? It's not like every horse out there wants the ankle. Some of them, you put them on it and they step off it. And you try them again, they step off it. They don't want it. And I, you know, I'm not going to fight with them. But the horses who take it, um, it, it has to change the angle of their pelvis in some manner. Um, now, that could be the SI. That could be the hips. It could be both. It could be some of the lumbar area. If you think of the psoas muscle that's underneath the lumbar area. And a lot of these horses, extremely tight psoas muscles. Um, it might just relax that psoas muscle just a little bit. Um, if they're weak behind, um, they have any kind of, let's say they had a, a layup for an injury or um, seasonal layup or whatever, and they come back and it's early in their training, they, they could just be it's a huge muscle mass back there. And there's some weakness and there's the instability of, of that pelvis. And when you do that, it gives them the opportunity to stand to the right, stand to the left, go back and forth and kind of engage some of those other, you know, maybe the groin muscles that they don't really get to engage when you're standing flat. So it'd be an interesting to, to be able to do some kind of kinesthesiology study mm -hmm. with that and see what are they engaging when they kind of when well, they shift a little bit. Dr. Adair wants to look at that. I don't know what's happened because I haven't talked to him since the whole COVID thing, but um, he was talking to me about a PhD student that was going to look at activation of muscles using the different paths. Right? Yeah. And, and it'd be, in my minimal experience, like I said, you might have three horses who get the same result, but for three different reasons, mm -hmm. right? But if they could start to see which muscles are engaged, it might help us figure out what does that mean? If he's engaging those muscles, it must mean, you know, his hips hurt, his eyes, yeah. his lumbar. You know, maybe, you know, I think sometimes we, we dismiss the shoeing too behind. Um, we look at their, the structure of their foot. And sometimes, I, like, I don't know how many times I've had horses come to the clinic to get their hocks injected. And it's like, well, I can't do that until we fix the angle of his feet because you're never going to be happy with the hock injections. And I think sometimes we do have to step back and look and see how does this horse travel? Is he landing flat? Is he winging around? You know, we're putting a lot of stress on his hawks. 
therefore something else has to take the load here. And we see a lot of lumbar pain um, in horses who have sore hocks. Um, so, yeah, and with um, with people that are working with dogs, when they're on the on the slant path, because we have one for dogs, um, one physical therapist actually reports that she can feel the psoas let go. Now, the problem with horses is that they're so big; there's no way we're ever going to feel the psoas. Right. Um, um, but we can see the response in terms of the change in behavior and the relaxation. Um, and I don't know how, I don't even think you could measure activation in this. I mean, how would you ever get to it? I don't know. Yeah. That's for, that's for the PhD to figure out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, because we can get to the outer muscles, you know, the glutes and that sort of thing, hamstrings, quads. But the really deep muscles are on a horse, they're just so deep. Um, right. And they're not easy to treat either. Um, sometimes we treat an area and, you know, we might be thinking I'm treating the back, but I'm actually treating the psoas muscle or vice versa or together. Um, but I think there are definitely those horses and in my, my personal practice with dressage horses and with standard breads, I see a lot of really tight lumbar pelvic horses. And some, and I think a lot of it is because of the, the repetitive moves that they make, it's the same thing, the same thing, the same thing, the same thing, and minimal turnout. I have a huge number of dressage horses who never get turned out or get turned out very little. And the standard breads, if they're at a racetrack, there's no turnout unless they get kicked out to a farm. So they never do get that, you know, relaxation. Yeah. Um, oh, and Rachel's piping in there. She's talking about lack of stability behind. Yeah. Um, and that's, that brings up an interesting point that um, I had one woman, she had two horses in their 20s, late 20s, that would twist their hocks and she used Surefoot. And um, it was over a two year period because she just wound up riding behind them one day and realized they weren't twisting their hocks anymore. And she doesn't know when that happened in that two year period, but um, they stopped and they stopped in her opinion, because of surefoot. But that makes sense to me because when they're on the pads and they're doing that little tiny postural sway, they're engaging your, your stabilizing muscles as well as your other muscles. But if, to me, I think that the hawk is twisting because something above isn't stabilizing so that the force from the ground goes through the horse. And if you can activate those muscles and get them to engage, then you're gonna stabilize that leg and maximize the ground reaction force. Right. And uh, and I get darts, darts thrown at me for this, but we see a lot of horses get drilled. They just do this, do this, do this, do this. And sometimes it's for the rider to master the move. The horse has it, but the riders again, again, again. And it's like, okay, you're really creating wear and tear on that animal. And it's going to catch up to him sooner or later, one way or another. You know, you might get a bad attitude. He might keep going. Um, but it's like, look, teach the horse, move on. If the rider needs to learn that, you have to remember you're on a living, breathing animal. You know, it's not a motorcycle that you gotta give them a rest. You gotta let them pop out of that. You gotta cross train them. You know, I love it when my dressage riders do cross rails. You know, it's like, do something else. You know, take them for a ride. You know, go, you know, around the farm with them, do something. But remember, he's a horse, he's not a machine. You know, and I think that those kind of things help because you know if you go to the gym and use the machines the machine is going to keep you straight but if you start to use the machines that can give a little or the free weights now you're engaging your core you're engaging all those extra little muscles that the machine didn't let you do and i think that's important that these horses get that opportunity to engage those things and if we're going to use a crutch like shortfoot fine you know if the horse looks happier He's telling you, I need to do something else. Yep, so we have another question. This may be beyond the scope of this uh, webinar. Um, someone's asking, can I use the pads on a horse that's seven months post arthroscopy where cartilage has been removed? If so, how? Um, he's six years old, 17 hand, off the track thoroughbred, lightly raised, long straight hind legs. I would say there's no contraindication for using them. Um, the I assume it was a, a carpus or a fetlock, but I didn't say. Um, I would start with a flat pad, see what the horse thinks of it, and you know, you just there's a stifle. Okay, so yeah, I if he's straight leg stifle behind, um, 
I would start with, you know, very, very basics. To me, I, I start with the flat pads and then I see what the horse likes, see if they like the ankles, see if they like to get softer or see if they just like the, the firm pads. Um, you can't change his conformation, you know, if he's straight leg, but you might be able to make him feel better the way he stands for a little while. But seven months post arthroscopy doesn't bother me. At this point, what's done is done. And you just need to, I don't think you can fix a joint, so to speak, with your foot, but I think you can relieve some pressure. Great. And um, yeah, so like um, we've, ha I've ha over time, we've had people ask specific questions like, you know, how would you deal with a deep flexor? And, and I really like Dr. Johnson's answer to that question that the horse really needs to have a good workup before you start using something like Surefoot when you have an injury, because if you don't know what you're dealing with, you could make it worse. Um, Without a doubt, you know, short of a diagnosis, any treatment is witchcraft, right? It's, it's a quote that's been around for a long time. If you don't know what you're treating, it doesn't matter what you reach for. Now, you might be right 30% of the time, but other than hitting a baseball, that's not going to get you in the Hall of Fame. You know, you really need to figure out what the problem is. And once you figure out the problem, now it's a cafeteria plan. This is everything I have available. This costs money. This costs time. This means the horse has to agree to it. What are we capable of doing in the situation? And then go from there. Yeah, that's actually a really good way to look at it. And, um, and in that regard, Surefoot's just one of the tools along with a lot of other tools. It's part of a, a overall program. It's not, it's not a quick fix. And one of the things that I don't know if you've seen this yet, but sometimes I'll use Surefoot pads and the horse will start to decompensate. And suddenly you'll see something that you didn't see when you started, whether they look acutely lame. I mean, I've had horses that look dead lame when, they, when I only did one foot. Um, I, I've had horses that go through an old pattern for 20 minutes and then shake it off. Um, or you start to sort of unwind things that are already there, but the horse is compensated and you can't see it. Um, and sometimes people get upset because they're like, you know, what's happened to my horse? Um, and the way I look at it, and you can tell me if it's right or wrong, is that we haven't caused anything with the pads. The pads are not going to cause damage, but they will decompensate so that you can start to see what's truly there. Yeah, so to me, that would be like the horse who rides on his ring at home, you know, for years, and then moves to a new ring and he falls apart. Well, the footing's different, right? So the problem was there, but now it's been exposed. Right. You know, maybe his, rim, his ring before was extremely firm, and now, you know, he goes to a show, and the show ring is really deep, and all of a sudden these things hurt. Well, he's, he's engaging more muscles he, you know, that he didn't have to use before. He's really pushing from his hind end. The, you know, at home, he could maybe skip off his hind end. So I would agree with that. I don't think it's going to create a problem. It's going to expose Yeah, he's weak there. You know, he, he's not using his belly muscles. He's not using his back or whatever. He's just powering through it and gritting the bit and going, but he may not be doing it in a comfortable manner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so... Um... You know, I was doing a demo once in England. It was for a vet uh, annual meeting, and we had a horse that not only raced, but it was a show jumper, and we all saw him start to decompensate and look lame, and she couldn't feel it. And we stopped, because if the owner couldn't feel it, there's, we're not going to take that horse any further. But, um, you know, it just brings up that point that horses compensate like people, and the whole idea is to not show our weaknesses, and when you start to have another choice or something offers you this other change and suddenly you can't, you can't compensate or you lose the compensation. Um, but I don't think that's always a bad thing because if we can't find it, I don't think you can treat it if you can't. I, I'm sure that you've had times where you couldn't come up with a clear diagnosis. Yeah, a couple of times. <laughs> you know, I think that's part of it is, I mean, the purchase exam, right? Somebody comes to do a perch exam, and I always like to ask, you know, how'd you find this horse? Oh, in today's world, it's always the internet. Where you find it? Have you ridden the horse yet? Sometimes they have, sometimes they haven't. Sometimes I have you know, a buyer on the phone, they've never even seen the horse. And we take the horse out, and I'm going to ask you to do things that I don't know this horse, and maybe it's never done. You know, I'm going to ask you to figure eight, and I'm going to ask you to stop, and I'm going to ask you to pick up the figure eight again. And I want you to switch leads. And, you know, the rider doesn't understand that this horse looks awful. You know, then sometimes I, I switch riders. I'm like, do we have a, get the seller off this horse. Give me a rider. 
you know, and then sometimes they look better. And I've had the vice versa happen where I've had a professional rider get on this horse for purchase exam and it looks spectacular. It goes to the new buyer who's a novice and the horse falls apart because they didn't understand that that horse needs to be picked up, that horse needs that aid, needs these things. Uh, so yeah, I think it can go either way. Um, and remember, horses age too, right? I mean, we yeah. all age. And no horse should be exercised 12 months out of the year. But as they get older, sometimes some of them need more time off. Other horses don't do well with long breaks. You know, they'd rather have little breaks and then get back to work because they lose too much, you know, over time. So they're all individuals, right? There's, there's, no, there's no rubber stamping here. It's just, we got to look at the individual and then do yeah. what's best for that person. And that well, and I think that's really true with the pads. I, I can't tell you how many people want me to give them a formula of start with this pad, do this for so many minutes, then move on. And, and what I always tell people is this is how you get started. And then you have to listen to your horse because he's going to show you what he wants, which pad, which density, how long, which foot. Um, and whether or not that day he wants pads at all, or, you know, today it's no. Um, and, and I, unfortunately we're so used to being uh you know kind of doing multiple choice answers or true false answers um that critical thinking or really being present and watching what's going on in front of us and seeing as you know we had a speaker um dennis the other day talked about seeing looking and observing and so many people are seeing or looking and they're not really observing where we have to like take these things that we see and try to form what does that what's going on here Right. Um, I don't think horses know how to lie. Right. I think horses are very, very honest. Um, they're scared. They behave in a certain way. They're sore. They behave in a certain way. Our job is to first recognize that they don't feel right. Right. And I'll, I'll, I'll get that complaint a lot. A lot of the upper level horses, you know, it just doesn't feel right. It's not that he's lame. It's not that he refuses anything. It just doesn't feel right. So, okay. And we have to now manipulate him in ways to try to expose where the problem is. But I think horses are honest creatures. If you're listening, they're talking, mm -hmm. but you've got to really listen to them. And, and that's horsemanship, right? And, and it takes years to uncover that. Um, I'm way better as a clinician and a diagnostician now after doing this for 30 years than I was 30 years ago, but even better than I was 10 years ago. Um, and some of it is just take some patience take a step back and look at the horse. You know, what are his ears doing? What's his tail doing? How's he behaving? Is he anticipating something? You know, and sometimes I watch the rider's hands. Like sometimes the rider's not even aware that they're lifting their hands to do something or one hand's dropping and it's like, you know, I mean, you're giving an aid or you're restricting something on that horse without even knowing it because it becomes second nature to you too. Um, and I pick up on that in a lot of purchase exams when the seller is doing a good job selling the horse that there are some subtle moves that occur. It's like, oh, that's interesting. And that's usually when I turn to the buyer, have you ridden this horse? Are you happy with this horse? Okay. You know, so it, it well, happens. It brings up a really good point that you can take one rider and they can, they can subtly manipulate the horse and make it look fabulous. But if you don't have that same skill level or feel, um, then the horse can't respond. Unlike a bicycle, if you hand a bicycle to somebody, you adjust the height of the seat, the handlebars, and off you go. Um, you can do that for the next person, but a horse, it's, you can't do that. We'd have a lot more people in the Olympics. Yeah. <laughs> if, if it was that easy, right? Yeah. And, and there are gifted riders out there who, who, at an early age, just they're gifted. They figure it out. And it was a lot of hard work, without a doubt. But the majority of us, it's blood, sweat, and tears, you know, and we try to learn as much as we can, ask the right questions, be there, learn what we can, apply it, learn apply it again, learn again. And, and then we still get into our ruts. You know, yes. How we do things. Yep. Well, Mark, I was telling people a little bit about your business coaching because um, uh, that's how we kind of got together. Um, and it's, I was just telling everybody uh, in the beginning before you came on how much fun it is actually. <laughs> that's and, good. Uh, and to watch you go from the the very skeptical like i come you know like we're going to do this business thing together but i have this weird product that's a foam pad <laughs> true it's weird <laughs> it's weird i swear you know i'm the first person to admit it um and how it, it and i and i will say that it's been really fun to watch you go from 
reserved and skeptical to curious to interested to engaged okay. and um and yeah. Yeah. So, you know, coaching and consulting is a, I mean, it's like being a trainer sometimes, right? And some people are, say they want to do it, but they're not all in. And when they're not all in, you know, it's the old thing, the teacher will appear when the student is ready, right? If the student isn't there, it's hard for the teacher to get engaged. So when you first step up, there is a lot of caution on my side of how much am I going to throw out here if I'm not here? But then when I see the passion come back at me, it's like, okay, this is good. I don't know anything about what she's talking about, but I'm, I'm going to figure this out. And even sometimes, you know, we talk about the different machines and the presses and all. I'm like, the what? The what? Okay. But I'll figure that out in our next meeting. But for now, I understand you need to buy that machine. You need to do this. And in a business sense, I can deal with that. Um, but I think it's like with any relationship, you know, you, you have to have that back and forth. It doesn't work. And we're all busy, right? Yeah. And, and we want to work with people who improve our own lives, right? And I would say the same thing. Initially, we had a little struggle just getting it started and figuring out each other's schedule and how do we do this? And then COVID happened. It's like, what's going to happen now? Then we realized, hey, there's some opportunities here. You know, we've got more opportunities now than maybe we wouldn't have had it if we were both crazy busy and just, you know, had to move on. So I like the consulting. I like the coaching. I like watching the business mature, the people mature, and then the aha moments of, wow. And sometimes I'm not aware of the aha moment. Sometimes you're not aware of the aha moment. And it's like, okay, we got, this is it. This is a good moment right here, right now. I, you know, my thing is the way I run my business, a couple of businesses, is I always want to be ready to pounce, right? Just be ready to pounce. And the only way you can be ready to pounce is know where you're going, right? Like right now, with all this COVID stuff going on, there's some people out of work, there's some people who need to make a dollar, there's some people who are willing to do whatever it takes. So what we've been able to do in our business is get some lab equipment at no cost because we'll buy the, the disposables. So these lab companies are sitting on this equipment that they can't sell, but they, but they could move these disposables, but the deal is in six months, I have to buy the machine or send it back. So they have an interest in me doing well with the machine, and then I don't have to front the money until I know what's going on. So there's always these opportunities that are in front of us. Or you can stick your head in the sand and say, yeah, whatever. And it, to me, it relays right back to the horse, too. How many times have you seen a horse who he's extremely well-bred to be a dressage horse, and he's over there in the jumper ring, mm -hmm. right? It's like, he's a talented horse. He just isn't going to be a dressage horse, or vice versa, right? right? And, and that takes some maturity from the trainer, the owner, to understand Look, there's no reason to hate this horse. He just needs a new job. You know, I don't know how many million dollar thoroughbreds I worked on who never made it to the track, but they ended up being great show horses. Yeah. You know, may not have been a million worth a million dollars in the show ring, but they're happy horses. Well, and that's with the pandemic, I I know that a lot of people are struggling. It's been really hard on a lot of people. And it's also an opportunity to reassess where we're going and what we're doing and make the decision that we, this is really what we want to do. Because I think if we're ever going to make a change, this is the opportune moment. Um, without, we, without a doubt, right? Yeah. I, I mean, we had this norm of the quarantine, which like today I was cursing coming out of the quarantine because it was traffic. It's like, oh, it's been so nice. I know. I could get places, I could get done earlier. You know, everybody was on time. This is great. And it's like, oh, we're getting back to that old rut of traffic. You know, now I'm going to have dinner meetings again. We're going to have all that. It's like, I missed the quarantine, you know. Um, so there, there's always something to be gained from everything. You just have to figure out what works for you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, th this has been great fun. It's been really an, uh, a pleasure to have you. And um, a pleasure to have Rachel give us a little bit of your background at uh, Tufts. <laughs> uh, going to have to go back and listen to what she said. <laughs> Nothing too bad, but that's really right. bad. I didn't realize Tim over was in the class ahead of you. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, so, um, and that you graduated in 91, is that right? 91, yeah. Yeah, wow. A little while ago. Yep. And, uh, I'm now hiring interns who weren't born when I graduated vet school. Oh, wow. Is that, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> so, oh, you like the bangs? <laughs>
because <laughs> my hair is getting long and I gotta do something. I don't know what to do. Uh, but uh, no, this has been great. And so I really want to thank you so much. I know that you've gotten busy and, and to make some time to come on the webinar and just talk about using Surefoot in practice because I, I, there are more and more veterinarians that are getting interested in Surefoot. And um, you know, I think it's really important for them to hear from their peers rather than because you have a different perspective and I can't diagnose anything. I'm not a veterinarian. Um, so the fact that you find it useful in diagnosis is, is really great. And um, hopefully more vets will start to think about that and consider how they can use that to discover what they're trying, you know, what's going on with the horse. Um, and we're all here to learn, right? And, and what I love is these freedom of exchange of ideas, right? I mean, we're gonna, you know, five years from now, someone's gonna use one of your pads or something nobody ever intended. Right? Oh yeah. And, and yeah. it'll be great. You know, we figure out, hey, look at that. You know, these horses who come out of surgery, you put them on pads and they need less drugs. You yeah. know, it could be anything like that. Who knows? So, yeah, awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm really uh, excited because I just feel like in many ways, I'm just the steward of this process. Right. You know, and, uh, and uh, just kind of making sure that it keeps going. Um, and it's really exciting to see what's happening. It's really thrilling. Well, I'm glad you went forward with this. It's been fun to work with you not only today, but with all your business ideas and things and it's exciting stuff right yeah and, yeah we've got yeah. lots more ideas that i won't share with you today um but that are coming down the pike and we're going to be sending some prototypes off to mark and and some other vets and have them check some things out and and uh who knows maybe soon we'll be telling you about some really great new ideas that we've been working on okay. look forward to it Yep. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining. And just remember, you can find all of the webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel, and you can register for any of the webinars by going to the surefootequine.com uh, website. On the calendar, I list the webinar, and if you click on it, it'll open a small box, and you click on that, and you'll find the link to register for the webinars. Um, we're going to try and bring Bob Bowker back. We're just waiting for him to get power back. Um, and as soon as we know that he has power, we'll get him scheduled and get him back out to you. So thank you all for joining us. And Mark, thanks once again for being my guest this evening and have a great night. Thank you. Take care. Bye.